Good evening. It is November 12, 2024, and this is a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee. This is a virtual meeting pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public is possible, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. We will start with the, uh, let's let's see who's here. Uh, Jennifer. Here. Mandy Johanneke. Present. Parque Ette. Present. Pam Rooney is also here. Pat DeAngelis is not here tonight. So we definitely have a quorum. There is no public hearing tonight. For those listening, the public hearing on University Drive overlay will open on November 26, but we are continuing it immediately if the motion passes to December 3. So the real discussion starts on December 3 for University Drive overlay. So we are, we're back to our favorite topic, which is solar bylaw. And um, I just want to thank Mandy for keeping the notes. There, and for, public comments? Uh, you're right. I missed right over public comments. General public comments. Thank you. Uh, general public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of the CRC. Residents are welcome to express your views for up to three minutes. We will not engage in a dialogue or comment on matters raised during public comment. When called upon, please identify yourself by stating your full name and your district or address. So I look to the attendees and see if there is anyone in the attendees in the audience. There are four people, including the Amherst Indy. And if anyone wants to raise your hand and talk about matters in front of the CRC, you are very welcome. Look for raised hands. I'm not seeing any raised hands, so we're going to move into item number four, which is action items. The solar bylaw, the basis for which is our version seven that we discussed on October 22. This, this version looks very different than the one I'm looking at, which is full of green green highlighting and purple comments from Stephanie from previous meetings. I had it in simplified markup instead of all markup. <laughs> Your color will be different than my color. Oh, but... okay. Okay. So we tonight is the focus is primarily on number 17.04 and that will be um, submittal requirements, but we have some catch up to do or uh, backtracking to do um, in this Article 17, and we're looking for feedback on the purpose of this bylaw. It was pointed out to us by staff that the purpose of a bylaw is actually to regulate, so um, I took the opportunity to use some of that wording and then also to um, create some sub subheadings uh, that had to do with material from 17.02, which is carbon sequestration, climate resilience, uh, economy and access to local food and community values. Um, last session, Councillor Haneke captured that in general. Um, and tonight, I think we just, if we can 
bring some of this material into section 1700. I'd like to hear feedback though, before we spend a lot of time, you know, typing and editing, does it make sense to do what I'm proposing, which is to, um, Mandy, if you want to scroll down to 17.02, it's the nexus statements that the, that the solar bylaw working group felt were important. This is why we want a bylaw. This is, this is why it's important. Um, and so I basically took these headings and the material and brought them up into section 17.00 as part of the purpose of the bylaw. Does anybody feel strongly that that is not appropriate? Mandy. So I'm gonna say, I I've said this multiple times, but um, I'm going to keep saying it. I I don't know what I think about these specific ones, but I it's what is the health, safety, and general public welfare, right? Because when you click, when you do these bullet points, I guess you're saying that carbon sequestration relates to one of them or climate resilience relates to one of them. Um, the economy and access to local food, I find it hard and a large stretch to say that the economy in general is public health, safety, or general welfare. And community values is a stretch to say that relates directly to general health, public, general Safe, the public health, safety, and general welfare. And then when you're talking about um, carbon sequestration as, quote, an key component of Massachusetts climate goals, well, you know what? So is solar. So is large-scale solar. Um, and so I feel like if you're going to put carbon sequestration in there, you have to put large-scale solar is a key component of Massachusetts's climate goals. We cannot ignore that building large scale solar is a key component. And I feel like when we put these bullet points out there, we're ignoring that fact. Um, and so I would like to keep it to just what chapter 40A section three says, which is protecting the health, safety and general public welfare and not trying to enumerate some components of that because we could be in endless disputes as to what comprises the health, safety, and general public welfare of the community. Um, I'm going to, if there's anyone else that wants to reply to that before I do, go ahead, Jennifer. No, I just isn't fully thought out, but this is a bylaw to support large scale ground mounted solar installations. So the fact that we have this bylaw, I think is a recognition that we see as part of what, you know, the town will have our large or could have as large scale ground mounted solar installations. And I think that this community does have values around climate action. I mean, we have, um, that's an integral part of our town manager goals and we have a you know sustainability director. So I think that enumerating general um, community values is appropriate in the nexus statement. That's just my opinion. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on, oh, um... Am I frozen or is, is Councillor Ette? No, I, I think you were just frozen. Okay, Councillor Ette, sorry. Oh yeah, it says my connection's unstable. I think um, at this point, it, the nexus statement in one form or the other is going to be 
in the bylaw, but I remember mentioning this, I think the first time that it is true we have values. On the other hand, there hasn't been a way to tease out what those values are, especially because there's a possibility that could be competing within the community. So in a sense, I do agree or at least coincide with what um, Councillor Haneke had mentioned. Once we put the next statement, we are putting our terms on the scale with regard to what we're emphasizing, but it's not at all clear that that is reflective of the values um, with the community. Thank you. I think my response is that when we think of large scale industrial uh, construction, which which uh, large ground mounted solar arrays are, um, I think what the working group is looking at in particular was the fact that there are um, there are some pretty specific issues related to solar implementation and that the um, property that is that is some property is fine some property is fairly level it it converts fairly easily but there are other properties that are a they're not developed because probably there was some reason for them to not, not to be developed including they're rocky they're steep etc but now they are being viewed as opportunities for for large solar um, arrays that the that the town uh, attorney suggested that there be nexus commentary for the purpose of explaining to um, somebody, um, maybe state legislators, that in fact, this is the reason that we have, um, as Jennifer said, we have a bylaw, we're looking to put a, a bylaw in place but we're also looking to make sure that in the process of that, we are keeping an eye out for potential disadvantages. And, um, and, and, the state, and the state climate goals and our own town climate goals stress these highly. And these are the two factors that are most, um, probably most susceptible or most vulnerable in the production of large solar uh, arrays. Jennifer. I, you know, I, I, you know, realize it's a balance. I guess my concern is to not include some of this is also tipping the scales. It seems um, noticeably absent not to acknowledge the roles, the role also that forests play in sustainability. So I guess that's my concern, that there be a balance, but the absence of any of these, I don't know if they're values or just, you know, what we're trying to balance with the solar installations, that also feels like tipping the scales. So I'm gonna suggest since we, um, we could move on with section 1704, the, the material that I was, suggesting which is the replacement for the general paragraph that that Mandy Joe typed in last time is in our document and I would ask that people read it and maybe that will help form your opinion on whether these are appropriate topics to include in the bylaw so I'm going to I'm going to bypass this we're not going to spend any more time on 1700 but um, the material is there and um, we'll talk about it another time. Okay, uh, unless Chris Restrup wants to add anything as part of the formulation of that material to begin with. I'm, um, I wanted to say two things. One is I am now um, a part-time town staff member 20 hours a week. And one of my assignments is to work on this um, solar bylaw. I'm a little confused about what Ms. Rooney just said, and I don't know where that material is in the packet. 
And is the uh, essence of what Ms. Rooney is suggesting that she's um, provided language that would um, replace the language in the purpose here? Yes. And and what how is that labeled? That um, it that is thing? in it is in the SharePoint, and I thought it was also in the documents that I shared. Um, Mandy, has your you have your hand up? So um, Pam could have answered that question, but it's in yeah. it's labeled section seventeen zero zero with bullets. PR um, is the document. Um, to Jennifer's point. Councillor Rooney's, Pam Rooney's rewrite does not include balancing at all, but the original one that I wrote did. I agree we need to balance, but what Pam is suggesting has nothing about balancing the need for large scale ground mount solar with the health, safety, and welfare of the Commonwealth and the residents. It's missing in hers from what I can see. Um, it says here the purpose is to regulate production of necessary solar, but not, and whereas I had provided one that said is to balance the need for increasing renewable energy generation with the need to protect the health, safety, and general public welfare. I agree it's a balancing. Um, to Jennifer's other point, adding a specific solar bylaw, in my mind, is actually not promoting solar production because the whole goal of adding this is to add regulation that no long, that does not exist if someone were to apply for solar today which in my mind is a way to attempt to restrict further the production of solar at least the original one that the solar bylaw working group came out with i was when i read it unsure whether you could even build large scale solar based on all the regulations that were provided in that. So I disagree with the statement that this bylaw actually encourages large scale ground mount solar because I think, and that's why I've been pushing back on so many of these regulations um, because I think it actually discourages the production of large scale ground mount solar based on how many regulations are in there and how intrusive and excessive and cost, large costs will go into the stuff there. Um, as to the rest, um, I disagree. I will just flat out say um, the proposed one in the in the seventeen zero zero with bullets P our doc that talks about community values, I disagree with them. Frankly, lands that are privately owned do not and should not be considered as providing recreational opportunities by default or relaxation to residents by default. We're talking about privately owned parcels here that then we're saying in a purpose would provide recreational opportunities and relaxation. They are privately owned we cannot force them, those landowners, to allow recreational development or opportunities on them, yet this purpose is saying that that's what they do and that is a value. It is absolutely a value that we have recreational opportunities in town. It is not a value in my mind that we force landown private landowners to allow recreation on their land for the public. And so I actually disagree with some of what's actually stated in some of these bullets as, as just statements. Um, yeah. Thank you. And these, these came directly from the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Uh, Christine, and then Jennifer. Would you be able to put up the um, document with the bullets so that people can see that? That's a different document from the one that we were just looking at. Is that correct? Yeah. It is different. Thank you. So Chris, this is this is essentially taking the material that the working group 
put in section 17.02 and at the suggestion uh, of staff that it just be made part of the purpose, um, I ended up doing it as bullets as suggested and much of the wording was the same. Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I don't, <laughs> this is a whole philosophical discussion, but I just feel like I should respond and say, I, I don't think the presence of a bylaw is limiting the development. Well, you always have regulations for building. I mean, you should, without any regulations, I think solar installations could be built, you know, as they were in Williamsburg, that was detrimental to the environment because there were no regulations. So, you know, I have to push back a little on the fact that because we have a bylaw and we're regulating it, we are um, putting a damper on the development of solar installations, large scale solar installations. So I'm I'm not hearing um, necessarily consensus to proceed. I'm I'm actually willing to go back to my draft, my proposal, and do some more work on it and put it back in the packet for an, another discussion. So I don't want to I don't want to um, line by line this if if we're if we need to do some general agreement on um, on the wording. So. Again, thank you, and let, Jennifer. Yeah, no, I it also, I know we can go back to the original document. It might be helpful to see this next to what was in the original bylaw that came from the working group. You know, for the, it could be it's, the next it's, meeting. It's, it's actually in section, uh, in our version seven. And it's, it's, verbatim section 17.02. I just did some additional okay. reading, carrying down of that, but the okay. material is okay. all I'll there. check that on my own then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So where we left off, thank you, Mandy, for pulling this up. And uh, so a question to staff, do you have access to the SharePoint folder that material goes in? Okay. That's where everything will be put for each meeting. How, how does that relate to the packet? So the packet has certain things in it, but the resources also has things in it. And how do we know which one to look at? So in okay. theory, SharePoint should equal what's online because if it doesn't, that's a problem. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yes. Um, back at the beginning of solar, I put in um, a folder that contained many, many of the resources that the solar bylaw group drew on and developed and referred to, and basically was carrying that packet with about 10 documents in it each time. So Athena was having to post it and every public notice had this, you know, they just came out and spilled out as, you know, 15 documents and it became pretty cumbersome. So I can, I can put the resources folder in subsequent meeting files and just ask Athena not to include them in the public notice, if that helps. Okay. So section 17.04, one of the comments from staff is that some of these are uh, redundant with rules and regulations for the ZBA and or perhaps the planning board. Um, it felt appropriate to go through in any case and assemble the, the complete list of submittal requirements. So then we could at some point decide if we were going to pair off the ones that were um, redundant. But I think it's very helpful for people to 
um, to see them intact and see a complete listing. Okay. Uh, Mandy, is that your hand? Sorry. Yeah, apparently when you share, you cannot raise your hand. Um, <laughs> one just, of the, wave, just wave it a little bit it, so I see motion. Sorry, one That's of the okay. weird upgrades that Zoom Workspace gives you um, and you lose a feature. Um, before we get to the submittal requirements, and I'll have a comment on that, the two first paragraphs seem duplicative to me. Um, one says the rules and regs shall apply. Okay, that seems like they apply no matter what. I'm not sure we have to restate that. Um, and the second one is, in addition to that, the following information shall be submitted. And I, I think the second paragraph is more important than the first. I would delete the entire first paragraph and I would um, change ZBA and planning board to PGA. Um, yes and also get rid of the, the shall also be submitted for review and approval. I have a question about one of those wordings, but I think it shall be submitted. I don't think we need to say also. Um, and I I reworded the for review and approval to is as part of the application, because I'm curious, one of the questions I have is, does the permit granting authority formally approve all application submittals? I don't think they do because some <laughs> stuff are basic and not necessarily approved, but I guess I need to hear more from um, Chris Gunther. and Stephanie and Dave about whether there is an approval of mm -hmm. every single document submitted, including random soil test. Do you actually approve a soil test, for example? Um, things like that. So I, I had some rewordings of that second paragraph with a request to delete the first one. Great. Thank you, Chris. Yes, I am. Um, usually the um, board, the ZBA or the planning board, um, makes reference to plans that are approved, either a management plan or an operations and maintenance plan or drawings, um, and those are approved. But as Ms. Uh, Haneke said, um, it, all the material that is submitted isn't necessarily approved. It's it's for information purposes. Mm -hmm. Is there a is there a slightly better wording of of um, than just um, approved? Then it I says think that Ms. Hen Ms. suggestion of as part of the application is probably fine. And Dave Zomek has his hand up. Yeah, I, I think I would just mirror what Chris said on the conservation side. Every document, as Councillor Haneke said, every document, or she asked the question on the conservation side, is every document approved? No, uh, they mm -hmm. are required to be submitted. Uh, in some cases, in all cases, staff will review them. And then if the Conservation Commission says, you know, is the... X plan or Y plan complete, you know, Aaron Jock would say yes, but they are not every document submitted. There could be dozens, if not, I don't know, there could be a hundred or more documents submitted. They're not all approved. The The overall plan is eventually approved mm -hmm. uh, and with conservation, with um, an order of conditions and 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 uh, guidance on how to how to proceed. So I think that kind of mirrors the ZBA and the planning board. Thank you. Yeah. So that supports that we we take out the word of that <laughs> the wording. Good. Uh, staff staff noted that in item number one, uh, an existing conditions plan. It actually needs to say ground based survey. So I would suggest that we say. Uh, ground-based survey of existing conditions. Great. Uh, and then I think we talked about this briefly last time, but I I am unable to look at paragraphs 
of requirements separated by commas, I really feel the need to make this into a bullet format. And I think that should be fairly easy. Um, if Mandy, you want to take the time to, um, so we, we can start with containing um, bullet property lines and physical features. Or just including. Can we do bullets like in item number two, or is it appropriate to have letters? Councillor Haneke. So eventually, if this is ever put into a ZBA, uh, a zoning bylaw formatted document, it would actually be 17.001.1. 01, 17.001.02, 17.0, <laughs> something like that. Um, so I don't know how we want to do it intermittently. Um, For the time being, can we do bullets just so sure. it's easier to review? Sure. So first one, property lines and physical features. Um, next bullet, abutting land uses. Topography, you got it, you're ahead of me. Roads, including farm road. Okay, now I'm adding some, so. I'll let you just go through and bullet first. Um, back to topography. Topography and roads need to be separate. So topography is one bullet. Roads, including farm roads, is the next item. Or is I'm a suggestion that I'm making anyway. And I, I'm actually going to look to Chris for um, a little bit of background. What I would like to do is pull some of the material from a much later number, like number uh, 26. Um, and they had things like uh, locations of rare flora and fauna on the property map per state national heritage program. I'm, I'm thinking just from a review standpoint, what are all the elements that would actually go on a site plan? And that seems to be one of them. It would be you know, are there zones of of natural heritage areas? Do you see that Councillor Haneke has her hand? I right do there? not. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, I agree with Pam that anything that we want on existing conditions should be listed under the existing conditions bullet. Um, which I don't want us to confuse with a site plan, which is number two, which is what right. is going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about the things that I, th this was the other point I wanted to make. I think we should delete anything that's in the ZBA rules and regs now because they have to follow them anyway. And it just gets confusing and then we're just duplicative. So things like property lines are already required to be submitted. The existing conditions plan is actually already required to be submitted. It's just, what else are we adding to it beyond what the ZBA requires? They require a plan with property lines. They require a plan with all locations of structures. They require a plan with all topography and roads labeled. They require a plan listing all of, and outlining all of the wetlands. And they require a plan that is prepared, stamped, and signed by a registered PE. Actually, it might not be a land surveyor, but... Um, they require a PE signed plan. I would like to see us get rid of the duplicative stuff now um, so that we're talking about what in addition to what every project needs to submit does a solar project need to submit because 
part of my comments has always been, why are we requiring this for this particular project instead of any large development? And so putting stuff in that is already required of any large development, I think muddles our conversations. Comments, Chris? Then I think um, someone's gonna have to take a careful look at all the requirements of the Zoning Board of Appeals and all the requirements of the Planning Board and match them with these submittal requirements and sort them out. So I'm willing to take that on, but it's going to take some time. Yeah, yeah. And in the meantime, I think, uh, sorry, Mandy, I, I'd like to get them all on paper so that somebody can do that careful cross-reference and we don't miss something. Mandy. So then can I start with bullet point number one? Sure. What does physical features mean? Uh, large rocks. How large? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's very much undefined. So physical <laughs> physical features in my mind is streams, um, um, roads, fences, Chris. Chris, fences, structures. Structures are listed later. That is structures within. 300 feet of the site, not structures on the site. The so structures on the site are somewhere else in this listing. <laughs> I they? believe it's a site plan um, or something else. It's actually uh, it's actually bullet number two, which is um, abutting land uses and locations of structures on the property and within 300 feet of the site. Okay, so we have we're missing a word there, and and locations of structures and. Structures within 300 feet of the site. Yes. So again, go back to what are physical features? And is that a widely agreed upon term that we don't have to define it? Or will people interpret that differently such that we should actually define it? Chris. Well, when an applicant, when somebody wants to get a survey done. They send out a scope of work to the surveyors that they wanna have the work done by, and they list all the things that they wanna have on the plan. And there's not a standard document that all um, applicants or all you know, develop, developers use to solicit um, bids from surveyors. So you do see different language and physical features could include many of the things we've talked about, or we could say physical features, including rocks, fences, you know, whatever you wanted to yeah. list, which some scopes of work do list. Thank you. The other fence, I never thought about fences, but yeah, fences would be something you'd want to pick up, right? Um, so in that, in the bullet with location of structures on the property, and within 300 feet, I think is important to keep in there. Unless that's covered with, covered by physical features. Great. Uh, we have topography. We have roads. There are at least three people with hands up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm looking <laughs> at the text. Sorry. Uh, Chris, Dave, and then Mandy. I don't need to have my hand up. I'm sorry. Okay. Dave. Simple. Yeah, I was just going to add things like stone walls would be included in that, uh, other features like that. Um, I am going to jump off. I have visiting family from across the country. I'm hoping that I've made Pam the host. I am hoping... Yeah. And I think I made Mandy. Yeah, I do not end the meeting abruptly, but uh, <laughs> by jumping off. But um, I will catch up with Stephanie and Chris on on what happens later in the meeting. Thank, Thank you very much, and uh, enjoy your family. Mandy, you had your hand up. Yeah. Um. I wonder what the use of structures within three hundred feet of the site is. What's that needed for? And why would we ask for that? Um, because and it's how probably would, wait, 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 another question. 
And how would a land surveyor be able to potentially get that information on a heavily wooded site where you cannot walk on the abutting land? Uh, there's a parenthesis that says abutting land information as available from the town of Amherst GIS viewer. So there's a really good chance they can pick up generally what is within 300 feet of that property. And it's appropriate for uh, starting the process of being able to notify people for um, understanding what screening might be needed. It's just a good starting point. Who are you but dealing with? Notification comes from who owns it, not who's got a structure on it. So you don't need the structures for notification purposes. If you're designing something, it's really nice to know what's around you. Chris. Uh, yeah, Chris. I think, um, especially with regard to screening and vegetation, you would want to know whether there's a residence close by or whether there's a, you know, gas station close by. And you would take different precautions based on what what you're dealing with. Thank you, Chris. I mean, um, Mandy. So then it's not general structures. It's seeking their use to because you can just put a box on an existing conditions plan. You don't have to identify what type of structure it is, right? Like, I guess I'm going for what, what do we need it for and how can we make sure we're asking for something that we need and for the reason and getting the information we would actually use it for? Chris? Well, I think the bullet right before that says abutting land uses. So if you had... Um, structures shown on an abutting piece of property and the land use was, you know, whatever it is, um, you would associate those buildings that are shown with um, that use. We could be more specific and say, you know, we want to know what's a barn, what's a house, what's a corral or whatever other types of structures there are. I don't think we need to get that specific. I feel like surveyors kind of know what people want to know about properties that are nearby and they usually put that information on the property and if they don't the um the board the PGA can ask for those that information thank you uh, sorry Council can Bundy. i ask another question yeah. yeah by adding ground based survey as the basis and then putting location of structures within 300 feet as available from the town of Amherst, aren't we contradicting ourselves with that one? Should that be put somewhere else or something? Because you're not requiring it be a ground-based survey if you're saying pool um, the abutting land uses, because I, I think in the past question I've asked about abutting land uses and you said pull that from GIS. When you're saying pull stuff from GIS, you're not doing it on a ground-based survey. So are we contradicting ourselves with some of these bullet points? And should they be put somewhere else? Or is only portions of this ground-based survey so that we would still say an existing conditions plan, including the following... Um, I guess that that comes to are the property lines ground based survey or are they based on GIS? Um, are the physical features ground based survey or GIS? Um, the location of structures are clearly GIS. Um, what's the topography? Is that ground based survey or are we just taking the GIS topography? So I think we need to be a little bit more clear with where we put that ground based survey. The words ground based survey, Chris, and then Stephanie, because I think Stephanie was um, part of the process for adding those words. Chris. So the ground-based survey really relates to the property itself. And so I agree with Mandy that there should be a, um, a separation um, about the accuracy of what we want for um, the property where the activity is going to occur versus properties that surround it. So certainly properties that surround it can be um, shown based on GIS information, um, but property, but the property itself that where where something is going to occur needs to um, be a ground-based survey at least for the portion of the property where 
the activity is going to occur. In other words, if you have a 100-acre property and you're only going to be um, dealing with changing 25 acres, you don't need a ground-based survey of the entire property. You re really just need the ground-based survey of the area where the proposal is going to occur. So maybe we can think of a clever way of, of describing that. Yes. So would that mean that the ground-based survey should be, the site plan should be based on a ground-based survey, not the existing conditions plan? No, the existing conditions plan is the basis for the site plan. So you have a, 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 a survey done, and, and Ms. Rooney knows about this because she's the landscape architect, but you have the survey done, and then you use that survey for adding information to it that shows what you're proposing, and that becomes the site plan. Um, the site plan doesn't necessarily include all of the information that's on the survey, but would include the topography and the property lines and location of trees and things like that. So thinking about ground, the ground-based components, um, we have topography, we have roads, we have location, um, we have abutting, well, no, <laughs> we have property lines, physical features, um, topography, wetlands, and um, slope. That's that's a, that's part of topography. Um, so we should at least have those, and then and then additional material or additional information, including, and we could do it. Stephanie, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, I just I was really only going to add something that's maybe evident, but just that part of the reason that came up during our discussion was that in utilizing GIS things are often missed because depending on when the time of year for aerial images occur, you may miss certain features. So that was the point of having the ground-based information as well to make sure that you capture things that may be missed in a GIS view. Thank you, yep. Chris. Uh, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, I think Councillor Haneke asked about whether property lines would be shown on the ground. And they're really not, but they're shown on a survey that may be at the Registry of Deeds, but they're also um, available to figure out based on um, pins on the property or some physical feature on the property from which um, you start. You, in other words, there may be a, um, a nail in a tree and you start from that point and then you go so many um, feet in one direction in a, a, a northwesterly direction and then you go in a different direction. So you sort of work your way around the property based on physical features, but the information that you're using is really, um, some of it is on the ground, but some of it is also in a deed in a deed description. Mm -hmm. um, so, <clears throat> so it's a little of both. <clears throat> if I may. Go ahead, Chris. I, I guess I mean, my question with that was, are you seeking to confirm the property lines with a ground-based survey, or are you seeking to just have the property lines there based on GIS? <laughs> I would confirm. <laughs> I've I've been in that difficulty before. I would definitely confirm if I'm building something on that site. And I guess my question is the same with topography. GIS has a topography, a, a topographical map attached to it. Are you asking that they reproduce that on the ground or just use the GIS topography? Chris. Um, you're asking them to confirm confirm it by taking spot elevations. Yeah. And you can tell them, you know, how many spot elevations over a certain area. Um, but you really do want them to confirm that the information is is correct because GIS is accurate to a certain degree, but especially if there's tree cover, um, you can have uh, anomalies. 
And um, we've run into this recently on, on a certain project. I won't name the project, but um, where it was very important to get a ground-based survey of the topography and not just have GIS survey. I'd like to make a comment before, before Mandy speaks again. I think um, these are... These are conditions, uh, as we've said, some of these are are may may be redundant with what the permit granting authority already has in their regulations. I don't feel the need to be so specific that we tell them they're going to do topography with spot elevations. It is general practice. They're going to produce a map that needs to. Things are going to be verified. They need to put their stamp on it. They're going to, you know, their their reputation rides on the work that they do. I don't want to spell out that they have to have two nails in each tree where they turn the corner in this bylaw. So I would like to, I would like to back off on some of the detail here. Oh, Councillor Hanneke has her hand up. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. So I agree with that with vegetation. <laughs> um, I read this vegetation and I don't quite understand what we're going for or why we need it and what it would be used for. And... Um, Vegetation has a parenthetical of mature trees, shrubs, open fields, special habitat elements, etc. Special habitat elements isn't really vegetation from my just basic reading of English. Um, maybe it's got a specific industry, you know, industry reference that I don't get. Um, shrubs mature trees what trees or are we going for this area of land is trees this area of land is field this area of land is shrubs but the way this and i i just and what is its use i guess is the next thing what would a permit granting authority use it for and then i actually had a couple of things we should add bringing in some of the later numbers into this because those later numbers were actually basically asking for additional existing conditions. Right, I agree with that, yes. Right, uh, Chris. So often you see on a survey um, kind of a cloud-like um, image and within the cloud-like image, um, a surveyor might write mature trees or the surveyor might write shrubs or the surveyor might write open meadow. Um, I don't think they're going to write special habitat elements. And I agree with Councillor Haneke that that's getting into really specifics as far as things that the Conservation Commission would be interested in. But certainly mature trees, shrubs, and open field are common in terms of parlance for surveyors to put on a plan. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't object to that. Do we need the parenthetical? Or is characteristics of vegetation sufficient enough? It depends on which surveyor you're dealing with. Sometimes you have to be pretty specific and sometimes you don't. Um, on that particular bullet, I was going to say something like from the other um, items, characteristics and extent of land cover types rather than just characteristics of vegetation. We're talking about cover type. And if work is being done within the wetland buffer and CONCOM comes back and says, you've, you've destroyed or you are impacting X number of square feet of upland or not upland, <laughs> wetland, wetland, wet meadow or something like that, you need to know what you're supposed to replicate or mitigate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we don't have wetlands on here yet, and that's clearly something that needs to be added as part of 
surveyed wetland. I think it is on there under E. Is it? I can't read it. That's why I can't see hands is because I'm having to squint at the screen. There you go. Wetlands. Got it. Uh, Chris, is it appropriate to add the word wetlands and vernal pools? I think wetlands incorporates vernal pools. Okay. I can confirm that. Um, another thing to add is slopes. As in a slope map, that's yeah. not, it's an existing condition, but it would is, be diagrammed. Chris? Is the slope a ground-based survey thing? What's I, that I, I would um, request a slope map if someone thought that was really important, but I think that um, you can usually tell roughly what the slope is by looking at the topography. So I don't I don't consider a slope map as part of the existing conditions, but I could, I, I obviously, Ms. Rooney is a landscape architect. She has made that statement that she would expect a slope map. In my experience, I wouldn't expect a slope map. Well, given that we regulate when you can build on a slope or not within this bylaw, it is a slope map. I, I feel like a slope map might be important because we say, 15 degree slope or something beyond that you can't build right right chris i think you um people who are reviewing the plans can figure it out um you know people in say the planning department or the conservation department are able to look at a plan and determine what the slope is and if we had a particular question about an area we might ask um but if Councillor Rooney thinks that's really important, then um, it would probably be a separate map that would um, would show slope because there's going to be so much on this existing conditions map that having slopes on it too would be um, kind of overwhelming uh, in terms of information. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. And it may be that existing conditions might be actually several, several plans, but um, since I used to have to draw slope maps and identify where where areas were, you know, exceeded a certain percent slope, um, it's one thing to ask the staff to do that. It's another to say, on this particular site, you know, some might be fairly flat. Um, I'm not going to fall on my sword over a slope map, but it it seems like I, I'm thinking of some of the wooded areas around here or um, topography in Amherst where you should not be putting um, solar arrays because the slope is too steep. So it's it's not um, it's not critical. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna push for that. But um, one other one other um, but we do say, as Mandy pointed out, we do say you can't build over fifteen percent slope. Yeah, there we go. That's good. So that that just excludes everything else, and it just highlights those areas that aren't buildable. Um, Councillor Haneke. Christine can go first. I've got other things to potentially okay. add from okay. other sections of the bylaw. Chris? So we're thinking of this as a list of things that are required for a solar development. And slopes over 15% would be important for that. But if you were using this list for some other purpose, you wouldn't necessarily require that. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Yeah, and we're trying to focus. If yeah. if we if we cut out redundancies, this might be one that stays because it's so specific to mm -hmm. solar development. Um, Mandy, you want to add your note, and then I've got another bullet to add to. Yeah. Um, I struggle with these. I'm going to put them in here because they're kind of long. Um, and I'll go through them. Um, just like I struggle with um, abutting land uses and wetlands, although wetlands I can see, um, the floodplain and the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, these came from other submittal requirements 
yep. and permanently protected open space. They're all part of GIS. And so I wonder, I, I struggle with why do we need them on a s existing plan or on a plan? I guess I can understand why they need to be on some plans. Um, but to me, they would need to be more on the site plan than the existing conditions plan because the site plan is where you see what they're trying to do where not you know the existing conditions plan doesn't set forth what's being disturbed um, whereas the site plan does so wetlands floodplains um, wellhead protection areas permanently protected open space these natural heritage ones shouldn't they be on the site plan to make sure that the site isn't that the site plan isn't encroaching on any of these versus on an existing conditions plan because it's not clear to me how easy a site plan is to overlay onto an existing conditions plan if you've got them on two separate documents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I did pull these from like other places in submittal requirements. Right. Chris or Stephanie? I think it's reasonable to have them on an existing conditions plan. And then um, if it becomes an issue, then you might show them on the site plan as well, or the uh, board PGA could ask to have them shown on the site plan. Um, you don't want to get too much information on a site plan because it gets muddy and it's hard to read. And um, people who are used to looking at plans can look at an existing conditions plan and look at a site plan and kind of figure out um, where things are in relation to one another. But these things uh, could be could be very important. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it feels good to put them all together instead of, as you're saying, scattered kind of through the rest of the bullets. Um, mm -hmm. I also wanted to add uh, soil type, soil types, because some are highly erodible, some are not, and that's an appro appropriate thing to have. And that came from another bullet further along. Mm -hmm. So we have a fairly complete list of, um, of things that we want to see on an existing plan, which simply helps set the set the stage for, okay, what are you what what now what are you proposing to do on this site with all these characteristics, Mandy? One last question about the prepared, stamped, and signed by a registered land surveyor. Um, the rules and regs all plans to be prepared and stamped by, I think, a registered PE. Um, do we need that caveat or that requirement listed separate here? Um, or is it good enough that regs and rules require those stamps. Chris? I think you could say either or, but if it were a registered PE, he would probably also um, be very knowledgeable about land surveying. So either one I think would be appropriate. Probably an engineer isn't going to want to spend his time in the field doing a <laughs> land survey and he would leave that to the land surveyor, but I think either one could do it. Well, I guess my question is, can we just delete that bullet point here? Because the rules and regs require these existing conditions plan to be stamped and signed. Do we do we okay. even need, I guess the question is, is do we need this yeah. here or can it be deleted? <laughs> well, it is a requirement in the rules and regulations for both the ZBA and the planning board, so you could delete it. So we could delete it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's, this is step two. We start to delete some of the things that are redundant. And so we can, we'll just say in PGA. Okay, good. Sorry, I had one more that I missed in my, sure that I, I had added. Um, uh, the historic buildings, again, it, it's, it's lower down somewhere. Um, in the submittal requirements. And I will mm -hmm. say, I moved it up here. I actually disagree with a number of these in here and would love to come back and have a further discussion about that. But I was also looking at this from a, how can we make 
the submittal requirements easier to read and be manageable because there were so many different things in so many spots. Um, but so I, I'm not agreeing with all of these on here, but I feel like this is, if we're going to have them, this is the spot that they should be. Um, and this historic building one we'll find, we'll see later on that I'll be seeking to delete there. Would that be uh, related to location of structures on the property and within 300 feet that perhaps um, including historic structures? I mean, they're all gonna be included. The notation is, are they historic or not? Yeah, and I think we can do the scenic roads and byways along with roads somewhere. So it would be the local or national register historic districts that would be new, I guess. I'm just trying to think, well, we have we have some outlying, not in Amherst necessarily historic districts, but. Um... We have inventoried historic buildings. There's a, there's a uh, state website, MACRIS, I forget what that stands for, but that has all of the inventoried historic buildings. Um, so I don't know what to say about whether to leave it here or, or put it up there. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll get it. We'll get it on the list at least for now. Great. Good. Thank you. And while we're still in here, can we under F can, it, roads and, okay, I was going to say roads. Roads including scenic roads. And farm roads. And I think one of the one of the components of farm roads is that they, if you can reuse them, you don't have to excavate, you don't have to impact additional ground. So I think we need to distinguish between roads abutting the property and roads on the property. Mm -hmm. So let's make them two separate things. Well, I think I think we can do it within the same bullet, but I think when people reference just roads. Presumably, that was a reference to both, and yeah. and are we going with abutting public ways, scenic roads, and byways, and property farm? I, I, let's say let's say public roads abutting. Um, including abutting scenic roads and byways and farm roads. Could be logging roads. Or logging roads. Yeah. Logging roads. Great. Right. And we can we can deal with um, formatting later. We're on number two. It's now seven forty two. Now we are on the excite Mandy. Sorry, I just have my hand up for to discuss number two. So <laughs> you can start. <laughs> do you do you, do you have something to say that you want to? Oh, I got a lot. But um, <laughs> um, I have some deletions. I have, there's a lot of this was duplicative of ZBA requirements for site plans. Um, but in the, in the up, in the first, the, the including part, site plans showing proposed changes to the landscape of the site. Um, I thought that was a weird wording. Changes to the property, including like landscape of the site seemed strange to me. Is that a standard wording 
when we're talking about site plans, Chris? I think this is lifted from some other uh, bylaw, yeah. Yeah. some other town's bylaw. So changes to the property would be yeah. perfectly or to fine. The site. Yeah. Great. I'm glad somebody else spells property the same way I do. And <laughs> it always it always kites out wrong. Okay. So we have, let me just double check. Um I'm checking the staff list now. Um, and the comment on staff was site plans showing um the, the question was, are we showing on the site plan, are we showing existing or proposed? And and we have already captured existing grading or I mean, existing topography on the existing plan, this shows changes through grading plans of what they propose. So I think that clarified is clarified. So site uh, staff says site plans showing proposed changes to landscape, including this, is, oh, this is duplicative of the requirements of their boards and committees, identified those that are un unique to solar projects. I actually looked through the list and, and thought that many of these are um, pretty specific to solar, the solar projects. Um, so, but we can we can comb through those again um, as after we finish. Chris. I thought we were going to just go through this list and leave it yeah. as it was for now and then go back and look at the requirements of the planning board and the zoning board of appeals and match them to this right. list right later we're just trying to keep dumping. not going to deal with that topic right now that was yes. my understanding you are correct we are not going to we're not going to delete we're just going to dump in mm -hmm. what we think belongs here okay so we have um grading information that's the same um i'd like to add stock soil stockpile locations to this list as a bullet. Mandy. And I was going to delete the whole topsoil and other soil removal section. <laughs> and so I'm not typing. <laughs> I, isn't there a soil plan later on? Um, I think that's probably why I deleted some of this because one of the, wasn't there a required soil plan later on? Soil, soil types. We included soil types. No, you just included soil types, but I thought there was a uh, uh, this is why it's so there's too many here um but chris a soil plan number 24 yeah was a it soil depends plan. on what you need it for um sometimes we have soil plans that relate to how much are you bringing into the site or how much are you taking off of the site or what's the characteristic of the type of soil that you're bringing in or taking off um and so I think it should definitely be separate from grading. And I don't remember what the soil plan says later on. I think the soil plan was related to not wanting to disturb the soils and have them preserved so that they could eventually be used to um, for agricultural purposes. And I think this is this is different. This is more related to actual construction. You know, where are you going to put the topsoil when you strip it? so that you mm -hmm. can grade the property and then you're going to bring the topsoil back on. So I would uh, I would separate grading and information about proposed soil. And I wouldn't necessarily say soil removal. I might say soil removal or import, um, but they're so two separate things. Can I ask another question about soils then? Just, this just a second. I'm, sure. I'm going to answer your question. And that was number 24, a map and description of all soil types is found in USDA natural resources list, which we brought up to the existing conditions list. So that, I think that was your later on. Oh, I had I some others too, that maybe I moved from a different number um, okay. into 24. I probably created a soil plan separate from the existing conditions plan. I know I did. Um, but so a site plan changes to the property. I've always thought of a site plan as this is what the property will look like when it's finished. And what Pam was just talking about of storage, soil storage is 
sort of a construction management plan in my mind, mm -hmm. what you're doing during construction, not what it will look like at the end of construction. And so soil removal proposed, all of that seems to me to be somewhere else potentially, not the site plan, mm -hmm. but, and or at least maybe what Chris was talking about, well, the, the topsoil, your storage of soil piles, I can't, it, maybe the site would have storage piles, but a lot of times that's during construction only, not after. And so I guess I'm maybe not quite understanding what a site plan is versus what a mm -hmm. construction management and construction plan is as it relates to some of these things that are only temporary. Chris. So we usually do ask for a construction logistics plan and that would... Um, that would show where proposed, where stockpiled topsoil would be located, where new soil would be um, stockpiled before it's used. Um, and there may be um, an opportunity to show soil removal, or at least there would be a description about soil removal. We usually have some statement that we require from the applicant saying that they are um, bringing in this number of cubic yards of soil or where they're exporting X number of cubic yards of soil it doesn't necessarily appear on a plan. So um, I think that Ms. Haneke, I agree with Ms. Haneke that it would be somewhere else, either on a construction logistics plan or um, perhaps on an erosion control plan, erosion and sedimentation control. Um, and not necessarily as part of the site plan showing what the change is going to be ultimately, because I do think the site plan is like you can make an illustrative colored version of a site plan and say, here's what we're going to do, and it's going to be beautiful. So anyway, that I, I do agree with with that. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think um, where we have the we have a plural, it says site plans. And I think we are, in fact, lumping all of these requirements. There's, there is going to be a, a full plan that shows grading and grading changes. There'll be stockpiled, you know, topsoil. There'll be, this is the extent of where the topsoil will be taken from the site. This is where it will be done. This is where we're going to put in our crushed stone at the entrance for the truck wheels to be cleaned. That is a, that is one of many site plans. And I think I think rather than trying to list the ten different plans that these folks, you know, that any construction project is going to have to include, I think we can I think we can lump them into the category of site plans rather than um, trying to enumerate the titles of each of them. If that if that passes muster with Chris, I think so. Yep. It's not all going to be on one plan. You're going to it have is to not all going to be I, on one plan. I, I totally understand things. it's not going to be on one piece of paper. Um, but I think we need more clarity then. If we're lumping in temporary construction storage into this site plan number along with what the site will be permanently looking like at the end of construction, then we need to be clear, clear if there's something that applies to only one or the other, particularly if it only applies to construction, that we indicate that we want it for temporary construction too. Because when I hear, for example, Pam, when I hear you say topsoil stockpiling, well, I only think about that as at the end of construction, not mid-construction. They'll move. Uh, they'll move those piles. So, up, you know, a couple times probably. Right. So, how do you put that on a site plan? <laughs> well, you you would show it on an erosion and sedimentation control right. plan. You would show it on right. a. Thank you. Yeah. There's um, a stormwater management plan. You're going to show your stormwater management. Right. And many We've of those... listed the stormwater management plan separately, though. I've actually said we need to get rid of it here because it's literally a separate management plan later on in a different bullet point. 
It doesn't say plan. It says, sto it says stormwater management yeah. systems. You are illustrating on one sheet. You are going to show your stormwater management. And then you have a document, a stormwater management report that describes how it's going to operate. But you have to show it on a plan or multiple plans. So I do agree with that. So Mandy, um, like I said, if we want to enumerate the 10 different plans that might come in as a requirement or as, as meeting this requirement, we can, but I don't think... I mean, this is sort of standard practice. They did they did some of these drawings for the library. I mean, there were like 10 site sheets and that's a very tiny site. So it, it's, it's pretty standard practice. And we're just saying we want site plans that will illustrate the following conditions for us so that people can say, oh, are we getting off, off track here? Stephanie. I think what you might want to say is stormwater management features rather than systems. Great. And then it would make sense to be on the plan. Mandy. So I had combined a number of these bullet points into one or two. Um, and then others are frankly duplicative of further later on location of interconnection, including poles and wires is literally duplicative of the, um, I think there's a one and three line electrical diagram detailing LGPI mm -hmm. associated components, electrical interconnection methods, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, a yep. lot of these are, again, duplicative. So I had reworded the locations of solar arrays showing rows of arrays as locations of LGPI inverters and BESS, which allows us to eliminate location of inverters yep. um, and battery storage system location. But it also, but the interconnection, including poles and wires is a completely different number, three numbers later. So I had deleted that one too. Um, Square footage and land cover type of each area that would be disturbed by the project. Um, the land cover type was already covered in the existing coverage plan, in my opinion, um, in the existing conditions plan with the with the vegetation reference. Um, the conditions of vegetation or I don't know how it was worded let's, up let's, here. Can we, can we address um, each of these in order rather than, than doing them all? Sure. And then oh. I, I go back to, I had actually in my comments was going to delete Ooh. stormwater management systems or features, but now I understand that might be different than the stormwater management plan. Although I'm still trying to understand how the plan is different from the features because doesn't the plan include the features um but i need i need to pause just for a minute um christine got bumped out and i don't see her in the attendees list she might so need some time to reconnect re re reconnect right so we'll keep an eye out for her okay so going to your your suggestion of um, consolidating, I think that's great. So yeah, inverters, inverters, best, and then interconnection. Interconnections on number, number four. Right. So I deleted it in two instead of in four. You could either keep interconnection yeah. in two or and delete four yeah. or delete it in two and keep four. And my preference was to delete it in two and keep four. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll so we'll keep it here in four. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, you had a question about and I still don't see Chris. Um, 
Stephanie, do you have her cell phone and that maybe you could text her to try to just log in again? We already, yeah, we're, we're already communicating. So okay. I suggested <laughs> that she try to log back on as an attendee and that you yeah. all would be keeping your eye out for her. So she's trying. So you might want to check okay. the participant list. Okay. Yep. I've got it open. Thank you. Great. Um, square footage and land cover type. That was in, in the existing plan. We say, you know, give us the different habitat types or whatever. And in this one, it says, I think, square footage and cover type that would be disturbed by the project. So where we're, where we're, and you've got a question, I can see it, go ahead. I guess, I guess what I asked before was, why do we need to put these on existing conditions when, you know, what needs to be on an existing conditions versus what needs to be on the site plan because how easy is it to overlay? And I was told that it's fairly easy for someone to look at one and overlay. And so if we're asking for the vegetation types on the existing conditions, why then do we need them to repeat that on the site plan versus just why does it need to be twice, right? So I, I would ask the same question if we had the floodplains on both or the biomap three or two or whatever it's mm -hmm. called. Um, on both. We're putting them on one or the other if it's not different, right? Um, and the the vegetation itself is not different on the two plans. You just have to overlay them to see where the site plan overlays on the vegetation. So I don't understand why it needs to be in both. That probably makes sense. So I would delete it here and keep it in existing conditions. That makes sense. Anybody else feel otherwise? Um, a couple more. The next one down. Um, I'm okay with the details of any site alteration. The species of tree over six inch DBH actually conflicts with the ZBA rules and regs, right. which are eight inch, I think, DBH. Um, I can't see my own comment here. Eight inch DBH is ZBA one. Um, and so it's not, it's not just duplicative, it's conflicting. <laughs> um, and so I would delete everything after alteration. Uh, just a second, Stephanie. Yep. Just giving you an update. Um, Chris actually lost her internet connection. Oh. So I don't know how easy it will be for her to get back on. I suggested she maybe try Amherst Public. Um, so I'll keep you posted. So Thank if she you. can yep. call in and use the phone number. Mm. Yep. Okay. I'll suggest she do that. And then we'll, I guess we see her raised hand that way, I hope. Um, so on that topic about trees, um, actually number 23 states that they should be 12 inch evergreens and 18 inch deciduous in number 23. And those are pretty reasonable. Those are big trees. So those, that makes sense to me. And to, to go further, site alteration is more than just trees. <laughs> so I don't understand the specifying the trees here unless you're literally aiming for tree alteration, but then you need to, you, you shouldn't conflict with ZBA, ZBA rules and regs, which are eight inch DBH. And since it's already included, I would, like I said, I would just delete everything after site alteration. Well, and if you think about details of any site alteration, you're already asking for the grading, the grading plan and air extent of excavation and things like that. So um, I mean, we could it's probably gonna be, it's it's going to be important to especially if there is some, you know, if the if the PGA decides that that this is a I don't know, a very valuable stand of 
you know, ancient oaks or something that there needs to be some sort of mitigation for that. Knowing where the large trees are um, is important. If you look back up above, do we do we identify needing to document large trees over 18, 12 and 18 inches? No, I think that, as you said, was somewhere else in the submittal requirements. It's like number 23 or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that bullet point can be deleted. Um, and frankly, the last one, we just moved up to a different, into number one. So the last two, I think, can be deleted. I probably agree. Anybody else? And then I had one addition, which will okay, uh, just a second back to back yeah. to calculation of slopes. So we've asked them to identify slopes that are greater than fifteen uh, percent. So we don't need to show the entire site. That makes sense as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had an addition of location of all security measures for the site. There's probably a subtraction later on, um, somewhere else in the submittal requirements to bring it up into the site plans because it seemed to make more sense as mm -hmm. a site plan identification. Um, I actually, yeah, on that, oh, Stephanie, sorry. Sorry, she is. Okay. Chris is here as a, as a um, she phoned in and so you could allow her to speak so that she can come in and contribute to the conversation. There she is, there she is. And thank you very much. So Christine, you you show up as a phone and so if you if you want to speak i mean i would just keep it open and if you want to speak just blurt it out so that we hear you okay i i was told to press star six do you hear me i can hear you yep um okay pam just Good. just I'm one sorry, thing i lost the last 10 minutes okay maybe i can do it we should change her phone number so that it's not, can you rename her? Uh, let's see, rename, yes. Right, change, there you go, thank you. Good point. Geez, I should have written it down while I had the chance. Okay, so Chris, what we what we went through, if you can see the screen, can you see the screen even? No, I can't see the screen oh, because okay. I um, have lost my internet connection. Yeah. Okay, so we'll we'll try to be um, explanatory when we're when we're describing something. Um, the site plan list. There were bullets, um, and we have struck off uh, the following. Location of inverters, interconnection, including okay. poles and wires, battery storage system location, and those got rolled up into a a, a a bullet above. So we've kept them, but they're but they're sort of all all consolidated. Uh, okay. We deleted square footage of. Uh, and land cover types of each area that would be disturbed. It was noted that we should be able to see them on the existing conditions plan. Somebody can do the essentially the visual translation of which areas are getting impacted. Uh, yes, we, I agree. Yep. We we deleted details of any site alteration, including number and species of trees over six inch DVH. Um, yep. Farther on in the document, there is um, something about including trees that are 12 inch over 12 inches evergreen and 18 inches deciduous, and we'll figure out how to work those in if we if we need to include those in the existing conditions plans. You know, trees that are that size may make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And Thank then you. and then deleted the last bullet, which was calculation of slopes throughout the site as a percentage over consecutive hundred foot distances, because we have asked yes. for on the 
on the existing conditions plan, those areas, in fact, that are exceeding 15%. So we don't really need to mm -hmm. ask them to calculate the site again. Okay. And, and Thank you. And for the list, I would like to add topsoil locations, unless we unless we included that in the um, or it, not not necessarily topsoil locations, but um, but um, any site fe features including berms is what I wanted to include on the site plans. Changes to or existing conditions. Because this uh, is site plan showing changes to. It changes to the property. It would yes, it would it's a number two, and it would it would be um we have grading. So let's say grading including um any proposed berms. And what do you mean by berms? Um mounded soil. I've seen a couple at different uh, at different solar arrays, and they use they mm -hmm. use some of the soil that they excavated uh, as part of the screening of adjacent properties. I see. So it's along the edges. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I have the same question I had above with the existence plan. This one also has that paragraph about stamp signed by PEs um, and mm -hmm. sufficient resolution. Um, do we need that paragraph in this bylaw or is that covered by the so. regs? Okay. Chris? I think it would be covered by the rules and regs, yes. Excellent. Oh, and Chris, we added a location of all security measures for the site to the site plan. And security measures, um, what do you mean by that? Cameras? So it would be, well, it could be cameras, it could be fencing, although fencing's there, it could be um, gates, right, um, for roads. You know, That's it could be covered in fencing. Mm -hmm. I don't know yeah. whether gate is covered right. in fencing. I don't know. Um, I think I put it in there or asked that it go in there. It's been a while since I redid this. I think it was somewhere else in the application requirements that I moved up mm -hmm. is my guess. Um, mm -hmm. But we'll see as we go yeah. through. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. I think Mandy, I'm just be, excuse me. Excuse <laughs> me. Sorry. Before we leave number two, um, I just double checked some of my notes and I think there was a note that I two two things I I would like to add, um, vegetation clearing and planting, and I and I think this is, it's it's kind of two different things. Um, planting plan I think is pretty specific, so I think a planting plan really wants to be separate. Thank you. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Separate bullet. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So stickler on wording, showing proposed changes to the property, including, I, no, never mind. Does it make sense? It makes sense. Okay. So we are. On number three. So number three, for Chris's benefit, drawings of the LPGI signed by a professional engineer, da, da 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 showing proposed layout of the system and any potential shading from nearby structures or vegetation, distance between the system and all property lines, existing on-site buildings and structures, and the tallest finished height of the solar array. That's a little bit kind of a little bit odd, pa um, Mandy. So I thought this was completely duplicative of the site yeah. plan that requires um, locations of LGPI inverters and BESS. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Agreed.
So number four is one of three line, one or three line electrical diagram detailing the G LGPI associated components, electrical interconnection methods with all compliant disconnects and overcurrent devices as required by state federal laws and regulations. So this is where all of those elements uh, showed up that, um, that we had originally in um, number two. And we have the word use best in number, we haven't gotten to number five yet, sorry. Mm -hmm. And so this that, is- That is a point though, um, for number four, detailing the LGPI and BAS, or is associated components good enough to cover BAS? Because BAS would have inter electrical interconnection. In Chris? I think we should include the words best or the however you said it. Yes, including best. I actually have a hard copy of this in front of me. So. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Thank you. Yeah. Love hard copies. Notes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. And number five, also, we do any storage batteries, we say, and any deaths. It's already been highlighted. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I, I had questions and for pen, pen, potential changes um, mm -hmm. to that one. Just documentation. I, I, I felt documentation and I would just start the paragraph with technical specifications of because documentation yep. seemed kind mm -hmm. of duplicative. Um, and then mm -hmm. to try and again um, delete or keep stuff a little more compact technical specifications included including rated nameplate capacity and reflectivity of the major system components which would get us to the glare issues and that nameplate capacity that i think might be somewhere else down in the application requirements but is obviously stuff we've talked about before so i can type it in here to yep yep so that you can see. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and I'd like to add uh, and performance history of of best specified including performance history of the best specified. What do you mean by that? It, uh, meaning that if, um, if the Caterpillar system, which has caught on fire in a number of places, is being proposed here, they're going to provide us the technical specs. They're going to say, we're going to use Caterpillar X or whatever the, the brand is. And um, the permit granting authority could say, hmm, we don't really want you to use that brand because they have had too many problems with it and too many fires. And this is this is something that Pat was trying to to include in her in her wording somewhere. It may not fit right here, but um, the performance history of the batteries. I wonder if that's a better somewhere else like as a separate line because it, it could be performance history or any fires or so yeah I, I don't know that there there could be i think performance history covers it of the of the batteries specified So, Chris, what's what's happening here is mm -hmm. on number five, it now reads technical spe spe specifications, including rated nameplate capacity and reflectivity 
of the major system components to be used, including photovoltaic panels, mounting system, inverters, and any BES. Actually, so that's technical mm -hmm. specifications of that BES. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think if we worded this to photovoltaic panel, mounting system, inverter, and BES technical specifications, it would read clearer. Yep. So... And did you also say including performance history of the best that was specified? I'd, that I'd like that to number five. I'd like to include that somehow. We this will make it work. So it says including photovoltaic panels, mounting system, inverters, and any best technical specifications, including rated name plate capacity, reflectivity, and performance history. Mm -hmm. Good. Great. Number six. So this number six now seems a little bit redundant and maybe Chris or Stephanie can tell us what number six really is talking about. So proposed wattage of the LPGI solar power generation indicated in both direct DC and alternating currents, AC, a notion shall be included, explain the difference, loss and conversion. Is this just a technical specification that could be uh, included in the one above it? I'll just jump in. I think what it's referring to is when, um, say, for instance, there's a an installation and it's, um, you know, 25 megawatts or whatever number it is. I think that's what it's referring to. Um, so that's different from, in my opinion, the technical specifications. It would be included in the technical specifications, but I think the wattage is something that is probably more of a... Um, a primary piece of information that you'd want to know about um, the proposal in general. Mandy. And usually they do refer to it in DC and AC. Yeah. So Mandy. I had moved the rate, well, I had added the rated nameplate capacity to number five because I thought that would cover everything in number six, such that it would make six mm, duplicative and we could yeah. delete okay. six yeah. then. I was, that's what I was okay. just going to say is I don't think you needed it. <laughs> right. Good. Thank you. Don't need six because you have included it in five. Okay. Thank you. Yep. yep. And I didn't know if maybe nameplate capacity was different than, than proposed wattage, but it sounds like it's pretty similar. So it's Mandy, amazing. this is, so number seven is location <clears throat> and details of all security measures, including fencing. So that really was included above. That, that's why I moved it to site plans. Yeah. So if under site plan, does it say fencing and any and any security measures? There's fencing and there's security measures. Can we just add them together since they were lumped before? Are you suggesting deleting seven and adding that information to site plan? They're in number two. Yes. 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 Number two, yes, right, okay. Correct. So then we are at, I'm just double checking, there's no other staff comments. So then we just go on name, name, address, contact information, oh. the installer. So you wouldn't necessarily know that at the time of the application, unless they're talking about um, the the applicant itself, like, the installer seems to be part of the construction crew. And after this thing is um, approved by the CBA or the planning board and it receives a building permit, then it would go out to bid, presumably, or maybe not. But in any event, you may not know who the installer is until after the permitting is done. Maybe, maybe that's not true. I'm thinking of public projects. Um, in private projects, maybe you would have your installer figured out and you would not um, need to bid it after your permitting. So I guess that's information that we want, but maybe not as part of the application. 
How can you say that? Uh, Mandy. So that was actually one of my questions for number eight was, would you know, because if permitting is going to take two years, have you even hired an installer? Probably not, because you don't even know whether you're going to get right. the permit. Yeah. Wouldn't it be more logical to so just that. be a condition of the permit when the permit is granted to provide the name, address, and contact information? Don't don't we have those typical conditions all the time? Um, but I think this yeah. one's asking too much, given that permits can take a long time to even be granted between application and finalization. So I would delete eight, um, nine and 10 are oh, duplicative wait, wait, of ZBA hold stuff. On. Chris, yeah. Chris first, and then I have a quick comment. Chris. Pardon? Chris, I said, I agree that eight can be part of a condition of a permit and you can delete it from the um, list of information that's needed to Submit. Great. Okay. Um, I'm going to point out that it's 823. Um, I think we're starting to get into some of the, well, maybe more pro forma stuff, but I, I don't have much else on the agenda. So, um, but I, but I don't want to go over time. Um, how about we just go to like another two minutes and then and then halt for the evening on this. So let's get to number 10. Okay, number nine, uh, name, address, signature, the proponent or the co-proponents, co that sounds fine. Um, and then name, contact information and signature of any agents representing the project. So, uh, Mandy. So, First off, nine and 10, I believe, are duplicative of ZBA requirements. Um, second off, who is a project proponent or co-proponent versus a property owner versus an applicant? I think we need to be consistent if we're going to refer to someone consistent on how, because the literal definition of proponent is anyone who supports the project in some sense. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that's not who we're referring to. Um, so, but I would delete nine and 10 because they're just completely duplicative of what the ZBA requires be submitted with any application. That's right. Yep. Right. Am I hearing Chris saying yes? Uh, yes, I'm agreeing. Yes. Okay. Okay. Then we are, um, okay. So these are, these are, these are submittal requirements, um, We've decided now that we we've, we've sort of stepped into into step two, and that was to start deleting things that are redundant. So let's leave it for this. We can always return to this next time. Um, let's pause on this. I will thank Chris very much for for coming back to life and uh, showing up at our meetings. <laughs> and Stephanie, thank you for being here. Um, this is we're little by little. Um, and you are definitely free to go because we are just going to wrap up the next agenda items and look forward to um, future meetings. The just for Chris's uh, for Chris's benefit while she's still on the phone, um, December three is when we actually start talking about University Drive overlay. If you feel like calling into that, you are obviously more than welcome to do that. Okay. Alrighty, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I apologize for my lack of in internet access. Not your evening. fault. Not your fault, Stephanie. Thank I'm you sorry. too. Um, can I just ask? So the next yeah. meeting, will you still be discussing solar? And that yes. the date of that one is yes. two weeks. Yes, and that will be on. The 20th. It will be on the twenty sixth. Twenty sixth. No. Yes, I. So Chris, I'm glad you heard that too. Great. Wait, is the 26th okay. a full meeting? Yep. Oh, okay. That's I will not be I, tr I tried to be pretty clear before. about that in the note to everybody. I may not have been clear. I, I thought it was simply to open the hearing and accept a motion to continue and then close the meeting. Well, that would have given us only one meeting in November. So, I mean, we're going to get sucked into talking about you drive for a while. So we'll that'll really put the brakes on solar. I will not be at that meeting then. 
Oh, okay. That's right. That's I right. had told you I can't yes, attend. Yes, that's right. You're going to be there for the five minutes that we need to continue. If you don't need me for quorum, I won't be there for that either then. Okay. Oh, okay. If I hope we have quorum. Pat should, said she would be back on the 26th. Thank you all. Thank you, Stephanie. Alrighty, good night. Good night. Bye bye. And thank you for bringing that up. I forgot to mention that again. Um, we have no minutes to approve from April and May. We're still waiting on those. Um, the next agenda preview on our from tonight's agenda is uh, University Drive overlay zoning. Public hearing on 1126 continued immediately to 123, and then solar bylaw. No announcements and nothing anticipated 48 hours in advance. Is there anything we've missed? This has been a stimulating evening. And Mandy, thank you. So I get a little confused. So in um, on your screen, it does say Councillor Mandy Johanneke. And so all I can see is typically like Councillor Mandy. And so I end up calling you Mandy. And then Freke Ete says Freke Ete and not Councillor Ete. So I sit there and kind of spin my wheels looking for what I should be calling people. And if I'm inappropriate, tell me. Mandy, thank you for taking notes. That is heroic, and and you're thinking at the same time. So, and I, I won't be it. available to do it in two weeks. I understand, or that. one week, or whatever it is. Yeah, one week. No, two weeks. <laughs> yeah, this whole thing got really, really messed up, and I, I apologize. Not that it was my fault, but anyway, it wasn't your fault. It's, it's <laughs> been very, con it's been very confusing for people sort of track where the ball is. Anyway, uh, let's uh, do, I, I'm gonna make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. second. Um, let's vote. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Frake Ette? Aye. Uh, Mandy? Aye. And Pam is an aye. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, good, good night. night. Good night. Good night.